Amen. Go with me in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And as you go there, by way of introduction, I read this week about Halloween night, 1938, when Orson Welles directed a very interesting radio drama. It began with a brief introduction that everything that followed was fictional, but many listeners missed that opening announcement. The show continued for about 40 minutes, pretending that it was a regular news broadcast from CBS. But over the course of the broadcast, the news it was reporting became more and more concerning. For, I mean, they were reporting regular traffic and other things, but then they reported that there were some explosions seen on Mars. And then there was a, a crash landing or a meteor in Grover's Mill, New Jersey. And by the end of the broadcast, the reporters were in Manhattan saying they saw clouds of poison gas flowing through the streets as Martian warships hovered overhead. The reporters began coughing, and the radio went dead. Well, it's not entirely known for sure what the actual impact of that War of the Worlds broadcast had on the American public. It was the top story in the New York Times. Allegedly, many people fled their homes in fear. There were major traffic jams. And there are stories and stories of much more serious consequences that are hard to verify. Why was this silly radio drama about a Martian invasion so terrifying to the American public? I, certainly, it was a well-produced show, but I don't think that was the major issue. The major issue is it was 1938. It had only been a month since the European powers had ceded Czechoslovakia to Nazi Germany. The world was on the edge of a knife, afraid of another world war that could break out at any moment. The problems the world was facing and the fear of greater problems to come, that fear led them to believe things they would not have otherwise believed. In fact, many people who were interviewed the following days said they had missed the Martian part at all. They thought Germany had invaded the U.S. Because they were facing such terrible situations and such fear of greater suffering, they were more prone to believe even outlandish things. And we see the same thing happening in 2 Thessalonians. Paul had, in the previous letter, again written maybe two months before this one, he had told them about the end times and the return of Christ and the rapture. He had given them great hope. But false teachers had come to the church and told them that the day of the Lord had already come. They had missed it. And because the church was suffering such intense and terrible persecution, they believed they had missed the rapture and they were living through the tribulation. They were in the reign of the Antichrist and there was no hope for them. So Paul writes to comfort them and call them to courageously fight against Fear through faith in Jesus Christ. So let's read our text, verses 1 through 10 of 2 Thessalonians, and we'll pray once we've read. Paul, writing to this fearful congregation, says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth, and so be saved. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your word, even when it is full of things we do not understand. Because as, as much as those things may confuse us, the things that are of first importance are abundantly clear. That your son will return. That he will gather us to himself, and we will always be with you. God, we pray as we face fears this week, as we consider our fears even in this passage, that we would be encouraged 
as we remember our Lord Jesus Christ. God, help us open our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word. It is only through you that we have hope to understand any of this, anything at all. We pray that your spirit would speak through me and work in the hearts of those who hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we dive into the text, we need to be aware of one major difference between our church and that original audience. I know our life is not what it should be. I know that. And I know that we do face some persecutions from different avenues, but I honestly believe if a guest speaker were to walk into our pulpit next week and try to convince us that we had missed the rapture and we were all living under the reign of Antichrist in the tribulation, I don't know that any of us would buy it. Because, I mean, compared to what the Thessalonians are going through, compared to what we read in Revelation, it's not that bad. It's not great, but it's not that bad. And so because of that, today we're going to strive to understand the situation and the struggle of the Thessalonians so we can learn some helpful principles. We're not in the same situation the Thessalonians were. We're not afraid. We're living in the tribulation. So the direct application of this passage where Paul says, you're not, well, we already know that. But there are principles in this text of how we respond to fear that we can and must learn from. The first of those we see in verses 1 through 3, where we see that if we leave fear unchecked, it will impact our minds. Again, reading verses 1 through 3, Paul writes, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, as we've talked about, it implies both, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. And then at the beginning of verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way. Paul here is laying out a four-step process to deception that we see throughout this passage. The the first thing is that when we leave our fear unchecked, it makes us short-sighted, leaves us short-sighted. Paul says at the beginning, do not be quickly shaken in mind, quickly. The church has responded to their fear by responding quickly. It was not a response of deliberate, thoughtful, measured, comparing to Scripture, none of that. It just came out quickly, and this quickness led them to be short-sighted and respond based on only the things immediately in front of them. And we are off in the same way. If we're afraid of layoffs, we're going to panic rather than remember. We're going to be short-sighted and look at only what's in front of us rather than the promises of our God to provide for us. Fear of conflict may lead us to respond quickly or clam up and short-sightedly forget that our God has promised to bless the peacemaker. Fear of persecution may lead us to respond quickly, to get angry or counterattack as we short-sightedly forget God's promises to protect us. Friends, if our fear is unchecked, we will begin to respond to things quickly, and any time we respond quickly, we are not responding wisely. Even if we're right, it's not wise, because wisdom calls us to speak slowly, to listen quickly, to listen and speak, or listen and, and hear quickly, but to speak slowly. Friends, if we give in to fear and begin responding quickly, Paul then tells us that second step. If we're short-sighted, if we're responding quickly, well, that will leave us shaken. He says, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind. And this word, we're going to really dig into the, the metaphor behind this word today. It refers to moorings. This is a, a modern ship, obviously, not the ships Paul was specifically referring to. But no matter how big the ship is, It is held fast to the dock by relatively small ropes looped around small moorings like that white thing there. The word for shaken that Paul uses here was used of large storms that would come into a bay, and as the, the storm lifted the ship, it would come loose of its moorings and begin to drift out into the ocean. Friends, the same thing happens to us. When we allow fear to run unchecked through our hearts, and we begin responding quickly, We are shaken loose of our understanding, our knowledge, our wisdom, and we are set adrift. Without our moorings, if left unchecked, our fear will detach us from the moorings of the promises of God that can hold us fast. We just sang, he'll hold us fast. But in the moment, if we're responding quickly in our fear, we forget about those promises and we are set adrift. And Paul knows this has already happened to them. Their persecutions had greatly intensified. False teachers had come among them, and in the midst of that storm, they had been cast loose. And once we're shaken in mind, if the fear continues unchecked, we also become startled. We live in a startled state. Paul says, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or 
alarmed. Unlike the shakenness they experienced, Paul writes about that in the Greek grammar. It it speaks of it as a one-time event. They were shaken. Uh, But now Paul talks about a continual state of their heart. They are alarmed continually. They are living each day in an agitated, unsettled, continually alarmed state. Like a ship in the sea without a mooring, the Thessalonians were adrift. And this just makes it harder and harder because even when we recognize that we're alarmed and we recognize that we're fearful and we recognize we've come loose from the thing, another wave comes and we're already alarmed, then we're, we're startled again. And it just pushes us further and further from the rock of Christ. And while the state of alarm is dangerous, the real danger is that when we're being cast about on the sea of panic, we are more likely to accept anything that offers us hope. As they say, any harbor in a storm. And so while the church has already short-sighted, shaken, and startled, Paul pleads with them not to take that last step and become snared by deceit. Beginning of verse 3, he says, Let no one deceive you in any way. They were already startled. They were already shaken. They were already alarmed. But Paul begs them, don't become deceived. We're not sure exactly what the situation in that city was. We know they were facing intense persecution. And they had responded by letting their fear run amok in their hearts. And and apparently a false teacher had appeared in some form. And he offered a new explanation for their suffering. He offered new truth that seemed to better explain their, their circumstances than what Paul had already said. He offered them a new anchor to hold on to in the storm. And because of the fear of that church, they were in danger of taking hold of that false message rather than trusting in the word of God. And if we allow our fear to remain unchecked, we will become easy prey to false teachers. Friends, I think there's a really important application to this truth. Anytime we're shaken and startled and adrift on the sea of fear, anxiety, or worry, that that only happens because we are no longer attached to the moorings of the Word of God. We must be attached. But as believers, sadly, I think we are often too judgmental in this area. Certainly there are some who are just short-sighted, and they experience persecution and hard, fearful circumstances, and they just cut the ropes loose themselves to get away from the situation, and then only later do they realize that being adrift is far worse. To those fearful ones, God would call us to challenge them to repent and to return to the truth they know. We should call them to repent of their fear just as Christ did to Peter when he called him to repent of his betrayal. But this is not the only way one becomes adrift. I think far more often believers know there are moorings, but have never been taught how to tie a knot. They know where their hope is. They know the gospel. They believe it. But when the storms of life come, their limited training, their limited experience are overwhelmed by the storm and they're cast loose into the sea. Now, what a shameful thing would be for the church to confront or challenge those people. To treat them as foolish or unwise or lesser than us because they don't know how to hold themselves to the gospel, to be held fast by the gospel. Instead, we should comfort them, teach them about the blessed hope of Christ. We must row out to them, tow them back to the dock of the gospel. We need to walk with them in faith and show them, hey, this truth about God's sovereignty or this truth about God's love or this truth about the gospel, that's not just a thing you know. That's how you get through the storms of life. We need to show them how to do that. This is something we should be prepared to do with one another. If you don't know how to do that, well, someone would love to, someone in this church would love to disciple you and teach you how to do that. We would love to help you learn how to tie those knots of faith. But I think this also needs to impact the way we interact with unbelievers because they have never been tied down. I think sometimes, especially when we've been Christians a long time, we kind of forget that. And we look around at our world and we see people fearful and anxious and panicked and every new thing is outrageous and every new thing is crazy and every new thing is the biggest deal in the world. Well, why are we surprised by that? They have no hope but to be short-sighted and shaken and startled and snared by anything that comes along offering new hope. This is why unbelievers demand not just acceptance of their sin, but affirmation of it. We see that in our culture today. We can't just accept what they believe. We must affirm what they believe. 
because they have nothing else to anchor themselves on but the opinion of other people. Can you imagine how hopeless and empty life would be? How chaotic and fearful every day would be? How every even minor upset could change your whole outlook on life? Don't don't get me wrong, they need the gospel. We should be sharing the gospel, but I think that should make us compassionate. I can't imagine, we say it as believers to each other kind of offhandedly, I can't imagine going through this without Jesus. But honestly, consider what it would be like to lose a loved one or to lose your job even or to just have someone be unkind to you if you didn't have a Savior. Let us be patient with unbelievers, gracious with unbelievers. Let us empathize with them. And most importantly, let us be motivated to show them where true and lasting safety can be found. But what will happen if we do not heed Paul's warnings? What happens if we continue to allow fear to run unchecked? Will we risk being ensnared and deceived as fear impacts our view of the Bible's message? In verses 3 through 10, Paul begins to address the specific content of this false teacher's message. And I spent a lot of time this week trying to understand all that Paul has to say here. And uh, unlike the Thessalonians, we're at a disadvantage. Because in verse 5, Paul says, Do you not remember when I told you all these things when I was with you? So everything Paul is saying in chapter 2 in this section, he is basing on things he already said in person. And we don't have any record of those things. I think the clearest example of this is in verse 6 where Paul says, And you know what is restraining him. To which I say, No, Paul, we do not know what is restraining him. The Thessalonians did because they heard Paul teach on whatever this thing was. But we don't have those lectures. We don't know. In fact, there's a lot that's obscure in this passage because we don't have that knowledge. Dr. Leon Morris, a New Testament scholar, once said that this passage is probably the most obscure and difficult in the whole of Pauline writings, and many gaps in our knowledge have given rise to extravagant speculation. So given that, uh, I think it would be unwise to preach authoritatively from this passage about the specific things Paul is addressing. Because if nothing else, I don't understand them. (laughs) And just for the record, St. Augustine also did not understand them. He he said uh, of verse 6, well, I don't know what Paul's talking about. And if Augustine can get away with that, I hope that we're all acceptable with that answer also. So what are we going to do? Does that mean we just skip this passage and go on to the next chapter? No, I, I think there's still profit here, right? All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. But not all Scripture is profitable the same way. So we're not in the same situation. We've already talked about that. And there's things we just can't know because Paul is addressing things we haven't heard. But there are still principles about how we respond to fear and how that fear can impact our message. So we're going to look to some of those principles and focus more on that than the details of this man of lawlessness and the specific content of this message. So that said, the first thing we have to understand as we try to fight our fear with faith is that Paul warns us in verse 2, we have to protect our message from deception by any method. By any method. He says, We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us. Paul speaks of the three methods that God spoke to the early church through. Number one was through the Spirit's prophecies and the apostles' uh, authoritative teaching. When, When Peter preached, He wasn't just a guy preaching. He was an apostle preaching the authoritative word of God, just like the prophets in the Old Testament spoke, thus saith the Lord. When Peter and the apostles spoke, it was the word or the Lord speaking through him. But the apostles did not have to be present. They also wrote spirit-inspired letters that many of which we now have collected as scripture. They were sent to the churches as inspired scripture. That's like the letter we're studying now. But the third and most common way that God spoke to the churches was through spoken word, through preachers, who would open up the Old Testament and show them Christ, who would open up the New Testament and explain Paul's letters. Peter even says there's things in Paul's letters that are hard to understand. Maybe he was talking about this passage. I don't know. But no matter the method, it seems that false teaching was creeping into the church. We don't know whether it was a a letter that seemed to come from Paul or a false teacher. We're not sure. But Paul was addressing the false teaching. Well, if there's going to be false teaching, how is the church to determine what is true and what is false? Well, Paul makes it clear in verse 5. They must compare what they hear with what he has already told them, which presents us a very important point. God never contradicts himself. So whatever we think we hear from God, it must match what God has already said. Paul 
explain this even in more detail in the last chapter of 1 Thessalonians, verse, uh, chapter 5, verses 19 and 21, Paul said, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. We as a church should be open to truth. And they as a church, they need to be open to truth even from a spirit or a prophet. But the truth must be tested against the foundation laid down by the, by the apostles' ministry. Every message, no matter the method, must be compared to the word of God already revealed. How could the church have missed this? I mean, he, he told them that in person. He wrote about that two months earlier in 1 Thessalonians. What is the church doing? I believe it's because they were struggling so greatly in their persecutions and responding in such great fear. Their circumstances didn't met, meet their expectations. Their persecution seemed too difficult. They doubted that this could truly be God's plan for the church to suffer like this. Though Paul had already taught and warned them, he'd even written inspired scripture to them that said they were destined for the suffering, they didn't accept that answer. So when a message came telling them that they were already living in the tribulation, when a new message offered them answers and explanations for their suffering, they took it. Because in the midst of fear and suffering, we will look for any port in a storm, and that's what they did. That's why we must be so cautious when someone today claims to be a prophet or to have a revelation from God. Regardless of whether we believe a prophet spoke to us, or we believe a, a spoken word from God in our, heart, in our head or in our, in our dreams, or if a member of another religion says they have new revelation written down for us in a book seemingly from God, or if we hear a message at a conference, or an argument on a podcast, or read a new doctrine in a book, or whatever, there's so many methods truth can come to us, regardless of the method, we must test all things against the Word of God, against what God has already said. So whether we believe that God still speaks in prophecy or dreams or not, I would argue he doesn't. But even if we did, the most important question is not, does he? The most important question is, does what he said match what he already said? The most important question is whether the supposed new word matches the old word. If left unchecked, our fear will impact our message through many methods. We must measure it against the word of God. This is why, if you notice Paul's preaching to the Jews, he would always, even in Thessaloniki, he went to the synagogue and he tried to show them, he, he proved to them from the Old Testament that the Christ must suffer. Because that was their big hang-up. They didn't think, look, I didn't think God said the Messiah would suffer. So Paul says, his main goal with the Jews is to show them, my new word, my new message that I'm preaching to you matches the old one. It's not new. It, this is exactly what Isaiah said and what Ezekiel said. The same thing is true for us. We must have our word match what God has already said. If left unchecked, our fear will tempt us away from that. We'll look for new because new is comforting. When in reality, it's not, but our hearts tell us it is. But regardless of the method, if left unchecked, our fear will begin to impact our message with false meanings. And before we read that, let me give you an example. <clears throat> when you wake up from a, a, a nightmare, uh, maybe I'm the only one who has nightmare. I, I have them a lot. Uh, wake up from a nightmare and let's say I've left some clothes out that I should have put away before I go to bed. They're, they're on that chair, on that thing in the, in the light, in the day. I know it's just a pile of clothes. I'm not scared of clothes. But in the night, I mean, that's a serial killer, right? Sitting in the corner. No doubt in my mind. Why do I think that? Because in that fear, I am giving new meaning to circumstance. And that's what the Thessalonians were doing. In the dark, in moments of fear, we give greater meaning to our circumstances than we should. And the Thessalonians are doing the same thing. So read with me verses three through four. He says, let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, meaning the day of the Lord, the rapture, the tribulation, all these end times things, that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. So he takes a seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Paul is trying to comfort them, and I think he's doing a good job. He's comforting them by reminding them their fear they missed the rapture is unfounded. Why? Because the tribulation period could not have started unless the man of lawlessness was first revealed. Well, who's this man of lawlessness? Well, Paul tells us he's a man, so he's a human being. He is of lawlessness. His very being is contrary to the word of God. He's a son of destruction, both in causing destruction and doomed to be destroyed. How's he going to accomplish his 
or what is his goal? It's to fight against God, to lead a great rebellion, or we could say apostasy against God. And how is he going to do that? Well, not just by opposing God himself, but opposing everything that's called God and taking the worship of all mankind onto himself. Well, based on the rest of Scripture, I think we can wisely identify this man as the Antichrist, the capital A, Antichrist. His person and actions are fulfillments of the prophets, especially Daniel 7, and he is much more described in Revelation, in John's message. And most likely, what had happened is the church in that day gave in to the temptation to try and identify one of their persecutors as the prophesied Antichrist, to apply meaning to their situation that was not true to either identify the the emperor of their day or their governor or their leaders of their city or whoever as the Antichrist. But this is the same thing when I think those clothes are a serial killer. I'm making something more out of the situation than is there. We understand this temptation. It's easier, it seems easier to live in dangerous times if we think we're in the very last days. We're the, the heroes at the end of Revelation. And friends, I want to be clear. I pray that Jesus does come back. I'm hoping the end times are like, you know, right right away. But so have generations and generations of believers. For 2,000 years, the church has been going, see that thing? That's the thing from what John said, and Jesus come back tomorrow. And for 2,000 years, the church has been wrong. We have to stop identifying things that are not identifiable by guesses. Because notice, how does Paul help them? He doesn't give them more information. He's like, hey, I know you thought this guy was the Antichrist, but let me tell you four more things about the Antichrist that'll help you. That's not what he says. He makes it clear, that's not our job. Look at what he says about the Antichrist. He says, when the lawless one comes, he'll be revealed, which is the same word used of Jesus appearing and being revealed. No one's going to miss Jesus. No one's going to miss the Antichrist. He says the Antichrist will come and bring about the rebellion. And it's the, not a rebellion, the rebellion. And as we look through church history, we see times of apostasy, but we don't see the rebellion. It's not going to be something we argue about or miss. He says, when the day of the Antichrist comes, friends, no one will be confused. We won't be arguing about, there there will be no Christians who have different ideas. We're going to know. We must avoid allowing our fear to impact our message by assigning false meanings to our circumstances. We cannot identify the Antichrist. We should not spend time or effort trying. Because Paul makes it clear here that when those days come, there will be no need to identify them. They will identify themselves. But there's a really important practical reason for this. If we misidentify someone as the Antichrist, is there any worse form of gossip? If we assign false meaning to our circumstances and build up the end times and deceive people intentionally or unintentionally, is there a worse form of falsehood? A way that will make Christ look more foolish to the world? Friends, there's a reason that pretty much every cult out there has falsely predicted the return of Christ. It's a common temptation for humans to think they have secret knowledge that helps them deal with their circumstances. And we've seen this in COVID, right? COVID is the plagues of revelation, or this this invasion is led by this antichrist, or or what, and I'm not, none of that, we don't agree on it, so that's not what it is. Revelation makes it, or Peter, or Paul makes it clear, that's not what it is. The only meaning we should ever assign to our circumstances is the meaning that Paul gives us permission to assign. In Romans 8, he says, we know that for those who love God, all things, here's our meaning, work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. The only meaning we can ever truthfully assign to our lives is that God is working all things, pandemics, invasions, persecutions, sufferings, deaths, sickness, job losses, financial pains, family conflict, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we know that God is in all of those things working to make us more like Jesus. That is the only, only meaning we can assign. Every day we know that everything we face is for his purpose. Every situation we know God is making us more like Jesus. This is so important, friends. Anyone who goes beyond assigning this meaning, whether in spirit or or spoken word or letter, is going beyond Scripture and should be avoided. But there is one further warning that Paul makes. When we allow fear to run unchecked through our minds, it impacts our message. We know these warnings. We know them. But we'll be tempted to follow anyway when we see false miracles. Paul says in verses 9 and 10, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity, or the energy, or the power, 
of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. The coming of the lawless one will be by the power of, the energy of, the activity of Satan himself. His coming will be accompanied by power and strength and amazing things. As much as you may not like this or that political leader, they don't have this kind of power, not the Antichrist. Paul says there'll be false signs and miracles. And from those words, we know that they were used of healings or exorcisms, not evil things, but good things. There'll be wonders as the earth is made subject to the Antichrist's power. And who will be deceived by these false miracles? Not true believers. Those who are perishing. Paul would never describe a believer as someone who is perishing. Those who are perishing. Those who are hurting. Those who are far from God. And you may say, well, that's a future problem. No reason to worry about it. But look at verse 7. Paul says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Already. Today, the mystery, the message, the power of Satan and his Antichrist are at work. And right now, the world is full of perishing people who will walk happily into those wicked deceptions because they find hope in these miracles and signs and wonders. In our world, most of those who claim to be miracle workers are charlatans. They're faking it somehow. They only bring people up on stage who can get out of their wheelchair or whatever other nonsense people try to pull. But I've spoken to members of cults who have experienced miracles. Uh, or at least wonders. And, I, and I've read accounts of false teachers able to do great signs. In Asia and Africa, there are frequent examples of demonic power at work. It's easy in our little Midwest town to be like, no, that's, you know, that's a future thing. It's happening now. It's probably happening around us. We just don't have eyes to see it. There are powers at work all around us causing great suffering and leading those who are perishing away from the truth because they are told that there is power and hope available. So friends, how do we live differently? Now that we know fear can impact our message, well, it's really kind of the same application to the first one. We have to test everything. We have to test everything. Every message, regardless of the method, even if it comes to us in dreams or vision or prophecy, the message must be tested against God's perfect and complete word of God. Against these 66 books, if it doesn't match, it's not true. It's that simple. Every leader, every movement, every church, every person, no matter how gifted or talented or cool or effective, they must be tested against the qualifications of God's word. Success cannot be our standard because the Antichrist is going to be the most successful man in all of human history by any measure of our, how we would measure success. We can't measure success as the goal. We must even test every miracle, sign, or wonder. Power is not the way to judge truth or God's blessing. The Antichrist will be powerful. Our standard must always be the same as Paul's. What has God already said? And this must remain the most important question in the midst of suffering. And that's when it gets really difficult. It's easy to say that when life is good. But let's say we, we struggle with sexual desires that are contrary to God's will. And we wish we didn't have them, we don't want them, but we feel them and we desire them. We're going to be so tempted to go after any message that affirms and comforts us. Or when we struggle with submitting to our human authorities, we'll be tempted to look for any, any message that lets us be affirmed and comforted and disobeying. Or when we face persecution and the world says, hey, we'll stop persecuting if you just change your gospel a little bit. We're going to be tempted to compromise our own message so we may be affirmed and comforted. Or when we look at our, our little church plant and it's not growing the way we want and we look at other people who seem to have the, the signs and the powers and the success, we'll be tempted to go after that. In those moments, our constant refrain must be, what has God already said? This must always matter more than any persecution, feeling, desire, or alleged new revelation, or new way to interpret old revelation. If the church has said something for 2,000 years, we didn't figure out a new thing in the last 50. That's just not going to happen. Friends, this is not simply Paul's cure 
for fear, holding fast to the truth, remembering the truth, loving the truth. That's Paul's definition of a believer. We'll cover verses 10 to 12 in detail next week, but, but for now, look at the end of verse 10. Paul says that those who are condemned are those who refuse to love the truth. And because they refuse to love the truth, they will not be saved. So if we want to be saved, we want to be faithful in fear, we need to love the truth. And what truth? Well, I don't think Paul is talking general truth. I think there's one specific truth. We must love the truth of Jesus, our Messiah. We learn throughout this passage, beginning in verses 1 and 2, that our only hope to overcome our fears by remembering and loving the truth of Jesus, our Messiah. I really believe verse 5 is the key to this whole passage, where again Paul says, Remember that when I was with you, I told you these things. We must remember Jesus, because if you notice, how do we know Paul's talking about Jesus? Look at verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the core of what Paul is talking about. As always, the core of what Paul is talking about is Jesus Christ. Again, let's read verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Notice Paul's focus. He doesn't say, now concerning the end times. He doesn't say, now concerning the things you're afraid of. He doesn't say, now concerning the tribulation and the man of lawlessness and Here's a chart for the end times. Paul doesn't do that. Instead, Paul reminds them of Jesus. He says, now concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. And you notice he doesn't actually say anything directly about Jesus. He talks about the man of lawlessness. (coughs) Friends, true biblical responses to fear and true biblical conversations about the end times are always centered on Jesus. What about Jesus? Well, a couple of things. Number one, Paul reminds us of our relationship with Jesus. Notice he says the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not the Lord, not the Son of God, not any of the many wonderful titles that we could give him. There's many important things to know about Jesus. But our only hope is if Jesus is our Lord. His power over his enemies is terrifying. Unless he's our Lord, then it's comforting. His knowledge of all things is really condemning. Unless he's our Lord, then it gives us hope. His sovereignty and power and his coming judgment should horrify us unless he's our Lord. Because then in these truths we find great comfort. Because Jesus is our Lord, his faithfulness to his promises are an unmoving foundation for our lives. This is why Paul begins by reminding the Thessalonians that Jesus is our Lord, because yes, their emperor may be persecuting them and demanding worship, and their government may be oppressive, and their family and friends may disown them and condemn them, but Jesus, the one with more power than any of them, is their Lord, is our Lord. So perhaps you're here today, and you know that Jesus is not your Lord. You've been to church, you know his power, you know the Bible, but you fear that he stands against you and not for you. What must you do to be saved? Well, friends, how can Jesus become your Lord? Paul tells us in verse 10, only those who love the truth are saved. Notice Paul doesn't say like the truth, accept the truth, grasp the truth, not even obey the truth. He says you must love the truth, and that word there is agape, that self-sacrificial, self-denying, all-consuming love for the truth. Uh, I want you to listen closely. If you think you know about Jesus, even you'd say, I live to obey Jesus, but if he's not your greatest treasure, your purest pleasure, your deepest love, then you may not be a Christian. I would argue that you're probably not. Paul does not say that those who know the truth would be saved. He does not say those who obey the truth have hope. Hope and salvation come only to those who love, treasure, and are most satisfied in Jesus. In the truth of Jesus. The truth we've seen in this passage, the gospel, that God alone is holy. He's the only one worthy of worship and absolute power. That we as sinful humans reject that truth. We don't love it. We proclaim new messages ourselves that we like better. 
We say we have the right to determine our own lives. We sit in God's temple and declare that people should worship us. But praise God, Christ has come to be our Lord. He was born as we are, yet without sin. And he lived his whole life, never overcome with fear, always trusting in God's word. Even as he died on the cross, as he suffered the greatest persecution, he had perfect faith in the Father, and to show his death was accepted as our sacrifice. He was raised to life again to rule and to reign. And in him and his return is our only hope for life. So friends, if you would be saved today, I would call you to not just know the gospel and obey the gospel, but love the gospel. It may cost you other loves. It may cost you other treasures. It may mean giving up other truths, but this is the only truth that saves. Will you love it today? If so, talk with me or someone else after the service. We would love to show you the love of Christ. And kids, I want you to listen really closely. I think sometimes when we talk about having a relationship with Jesus, you think that might just be for adults, but it's not. When Jesus was on earth, he spent a lot of time with kids. He loved kids. He would answer their questions. He'd spend time with them. He would teach them. He would often choose to speak with little ones like you rather than big people like me. So if you're here today and you think, I'm just a kid, don't wait till you're an adult to love the truth and trust Jesus. He's calling you right now to follow him in faith. But what about for those of us here who have already loved the truth, for whom Jesus is already our Lord? We can find great hope in our relationship with him, but but that relationship is not the only one Paul talks about. He also tells us at the end of verse 1 that we can overcome fear through our relatives in Jesus. Through our relatives in Jesus. For he says, in Jesus we have brothers and sisters. Isn't it amazing how different, how much difference being alone makes when we battle fear? Like I love being here with all of you on Sunday mornings. But when I have to come up here at night and I'm the only one in this building, it's kind of scary. (laughs) Just because I'm alone. The same is true when we face the fears of this life. We're not called to face them alone. We're called to face them together as brothers and sisters, to have each other's backs, to comfort one another, to point each other back to Jesus, to remind each other of the truth of God's word, to have a covenant with one another that we can know we trust one another, that we'll be there for one another. Certainly, our most important relationship is with our Lord Jesus Christ, but throughout the letters, we've seen the importance of our relationship to one another as brothers and sisters as covenant members of a local church. Brothers and sisters aren't just people who show up together at the same place at the same time. There's a committed relationship there. So friends, don't let your flesh or the world or Satan deceive you. We are not meant to walk this road alone. We are meant to walk it together. If you're struggling today, talk with a brother before you leave. If you're overwhelmed with fear, share that with a sister before you leave. I promise they would rather do that than whatever their lunch plans are. And if you're not a member here, consider joining with us so that you have brothers and sisters to walk through life with. This is what God calls us to, and this is God's plan to help you in life. Consider joining with us. If we're to be faithful in fear, we must focus on our relationship with Jesus and the support of our relatives in the local church, but that is not all. Paul reminds us of many things he has told them about Jesus in this section. The third thing we see is that as brothers and sisters, we must remind each other of the return of the Lord, the return of Jesus. Paul doesn't spend much time dwelling on or explaining the coming of the Antichrist compared to how much time he spends in 1 Thessalonians discussing the coming of the true Christ. Friends, no matter what fears we may face today, they are all overwhelmed by the infinite hope and joy contained in the statement, Jesus will return. So do you fear persecution? Jesus will return and he will free us. Do you fear sickness and death? Jesus will return and heal us and raise us from the dead. Do you fear sin and its power? Jesus will return and defeat every enemy and fully and finally cleanse us. Friends, no matter the fear, we find greater comfort in the promise of Jesus' return. And and when he comes back, he won't be alone. Paul says we'll be gathered together with him. We can find hope in the reunion with Jesus. The Thessalonians feared death. They feared it would separate them from their loved ones. They feared it maybe even would cause them to miss out on the kingdom of God. That's not the truth. Jesus will gather us together. We all, whether living or dead, will be gathered to him, and every blessed saint who has died and gone before us will be there in the clouds to greet us and rejoice with us as we celebrate the glorious return of our King. So, friend, do you fear death? Remember Jesus. 
for he, has the resur- he is the resurrection who will raise every saint. Do you fear wandering away from God? Remember Jesus, the good shepherd, who will find every sheep. Do you fear being unworthy? Remember Jesus, the purifier of our souls. But that day will not only be filled with glorious reunions, it will also be filled with justice. For Paul says it will be the day of the Lord, thus we can find hope in the rule of Jesus. He is no mere teacher from Galilee. He's not just a good man. He's the Lord of all creation, the Lord of the covenant. He's the one who the prophet said would bear the government on his shoulders and usher in peace and prosperity and righteousness and judgment. (coughs) Friends, he will establish his kingdom. So, do you fear government oppression? Remember Jesus will one day rule and reign and give true freedom. Do you fear injustice and corruption? Remember Jesus will one day establish a perfect system of justice in his kingdom. Do you fear living without a purpose? Remember Jesus has promised we will one day rule and reign with him. But there are times where this future seems to fall flat. It seems like evil is running around unchecked. And so Paul calls us to have faith in the restraint of Jesus. Verse 6, he says, You know what is restraining him, the Antichrist, now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. There's a lot going on here I don't understand. I'm going to be honest. Paul says they know what's restraining him. We don't. It could be the spirit. It could be the church. It could be the government. We, we don't know for sure. As I said, even Augustine said he didn't know. But here's the important point that I do know for sure. Whether the force that's, whatever this force is that's restraining the devil, whoever the person is that has the power to restrain Satan himself, we know for sure that that thing is under the sovereignty of Christ. So regardless of what Paul is directly talking about, we know Jesus is in control of that thing. So friends, as evil as the world may seem, even today in the midst of all this chaos and war and famine and death, Satan is still restrained by Jesus. John MacArthur wisely said, Satan, of course, does not want to operate on God's timetable. If he could, he would have revealed the Antichrist long before now. He longs for the false Messiah, through whom he will rule the earth to appear, but nothing, not even the purposes of hell, operate independently of God's sovereign timetable. So whatever evil we face today, we can find comfort knowing that greater evil was restrained by Christ. Jesus only lets the suffering into our life he knows we can face. He never overloads us. Nothing ever happens outside of God's timetable in the perfect and compassionate care of Christ. So friends, do you fear evil? Remember that Jesus restrains it. Do you fear demons and the devil? Remember Jesus is sovereignly in control of their plans and their power. Do you fear the end times? Remember, they're only going to come when Jesus stops restraining. But friends, Jesus' sovereign control and restraint of evil does not mean evil will go unpunished. We see in verse 8, we can find hope in the revenge of Jesus. Verse 8 says, And then the lawless lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Once that lawless one, the Antichrist, is revealed, he will not too long after, be destroyed. And honestly, I think this is one, I don't want to say Jesus is bragging or showing off, but he is demonstrating his glory. Because right now, Satan is restrained. He's, I don't know if he's like in a cage or what the situation is, but he's restrained. If there was a time to take Satan out easily, it would be now. But Jesus goes a different route. He's going to release Satan. He's going to give him control over the whole earth. Satan's spirit of lawlessness will spread his evil power. He'll have a false Messiah governing the entirety of the earth. All the people, apart from a few believers, will worship him. And at the very height of Satan's power, Jesus will appear, and without even raising a finger, he will speak, and Satan will be destroyed. Friends, we must remember Jesus' coming revenge. It won't be a close fight. It won't be a fight. Jesus will appear and speak, and it will be done. So friends, do you fear dictators and powerful people in this world? Remember, Jesus can bring them to nothing with the breath of his word. Do you fear those who would hurt you and abuse you and get away with it? Remember, Jesus will not allow a single sin to escape his perfect justice. Do you fear Satan and his power? Remember, Jesus has the power to kill and destroy without effort. Friends, no matter what we fear, no matter how we struggle, we must remember Jesus. Men, do you fear 
falling to temptation, remember Jesus, the high priest. Women, do you fear being mistreated? Remember Jesus, the gentle and lowly one. Single people, do you fear loneliness? Remember Jesus, the perfect bridegroom. Married people, do you fear conflict? Remember Jesus, the peacemaker. Parents, do you fear being overwhelmed? Remember Jesus, whose burden is easy and yoke is light. Kids, do you fear not being good enough? Remember Jesus, the beloved son. No matter what fear we face in this life, it can be overcome. And remember what Paul has already told us, that Jesus is coming back, that Jesus will gather us, and so we will always be with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the comfort we find in who your son is, in what he has promised to do, in the salvation he has brought to us. God, we are fearful people. We're easily shaken. We easily wander from you. But God, you are so good and gracious. Even when we slip our moorings, you go after us. You will not let us be overwhelmed. We pray, God, as we face any fear, any suffering, any persecution, even death, that we would find our hope in your son, Jesus Christ, whom you have already told us about. God, encourage us, give us faith that we may fight against fear this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.